resident speaker. Um, but I'll introduce him in a second. Hey everybody, George and Scott here, and we have got incredible news that we're really excited to share with you. Yeah, we're launching a brand new church. Actually, no, we did that already. So we are launching Impact again. Impact is getting that started makes up. way more sense than what I said because we we launched a church a couple of years ago. So what we're doing like a new four Impact years ago. So yeah, we're doing a new Impact. Impact's coming back. In fact, this is the space that we're going to be in. It's in the middle of getting remodeled. Uh, so it's going to be super modern, up to date, super cool. Uh, excited for the life changing environment that it's going to be. And it's going to be awesome because it's going to be completely online, all cyber. You don't uh, have to it's come in. It's going to be in person. It's going to be in person, not online. So not I feel people. I feel like I was in a different meeting before we. I think when we were, were talking about the uh, right. So it's going to be all video. in person. So. Uh, COVID isn't stopping us. Uh, it's not going to stop the life change. We're going to do the wilderness trips. We're going back to Catalina. We're bringing back Death Valley. Death Valley. They call it Death Valley for a reason. They do call it Death Valley because your flesh dies out there and your life gets transformed completely. And it's done. kind. It's not. Um, it's not a year away. It's not six months no, away. No, it's so awesome. It's gonna be July fourth. It's gonna be. There's fireworks. It's the best day to launch a school. <laughs> fireworks, barbecue. There, there it's are so gonna awesome. Be fireworks. There are gonna be a barbecue because we love good food. But it's actually start, starting October fourth, not July fourth. October fourth. Hold on a second. July fourth is. Let me. Last month. Yeah. The thing is, is uh, see right there. It's October. October fourth isn't a holiday. I mean, it's cool. It's gonna be great. It's gonna be Impact Day. It's gonna be a day to launch. So we're everything. launching Impact. It's launching gonna be completely Impact. in person. Completely in person. October the fourth, not July fourth. October, October the fourth. And if they want to get involved, oh, this is the best part. If they want to get involved, you want to get involved. First, help us get the word out by tagging all your wilderness. Uh, family, Impact family, anybody that you think would be interested, tag him in this video. Yep. I got that one right. You got that one right. I, tag him in this video. I so nailed this you video. Did. I'm proud of you. I did that so good. good. That was good. Okay. And then if they want to get involved, if they want to help launch, be a part of the launch team, or if they know someone, or they want to apply themselves, what should they do? There's a link in this video or down below this video where you can get more information to either help or uh, enroll in the program. And that's it. That's We're it. We'll see, see you, you October 4th. 4th. Anyone excited about that? Mm -hmm. July 4th, you're excited about that? Real quick, are we done with the kids? Go shoe, go read some books. Go away, go away, go read some books. We are blessed today with having one of our own from our congregation bring the word today. Scott Wessel, the, the guy that didn't know anything up in the video, is going to come speak to us. We'll pray for him. We'll see how that goes. And uh, other than that, Scott, the floor is yours. Come on up. Yes, please. How are you guys doing? Good. Am I on? Perfect. Okay, bueno. How are you guys doing? My name's Scott. I am one of the people around here. I'm one of the shepherds. Sorry, I just have to try and figure out how these things work. It's definitely not how that one works. I guess that's like tall enough. Okay, bueno. All right. My name's Scott. I'm sorry for the, uh, the hoopla right there. I'm usually, I am a professional, I promise. I, uh, this isn't my first time. Um, I am on uh, the team here. I'm one of the shepherds. Uh, I am one of the elders here. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, super excited about Impact, Impact 195, or actually it's just Impact now. Impact, if you're not unfamiliar with it, it is a discipleship school that radically transforms your life. I went through it. My wife went through it. A ton of people went through it. it it's, it's one of those places where that, that thing that you want God to do in your life and help you get over, it happens. And then like 20 times more than you ever dreamed, it happens. 
Uh, and so we're going to be launching it very soon. If you are interested, I know there's no link in the video that you can click on right now, but if you go to Abundant.life, that's our website, Abundant.life, uh, backslash impact, you'll get all the information. Sounds good? You ready to dive in? Okay, bueno, let's do this. So um, speaking of impact, I, when I went through the school, at the end of, of every uh, session, year, whatever it is we, we're going to call it, there's a trip that you get to go on, right? And so when I did it, it was, there was a whole bunch of different options, and I had to figure out which option I was going to go on. And so I tried one thing, and it fell through, and I tried another thing, and it fell through. And my, my, the love of my life at the time, who is now my wife, she was doing the same thing. And we were trying to like go on different trips because she was like seriously into me, and I didn't want to distract her, you know? <laughs> And if, if you know me, it's actually the opposite was true. But um, so we we're trying to go on different trips, but everything we tried to do failed and fell through. And because you were trying, you had to like plan your own trip back in those days. And so we ended up having to figure out, first of all, George is like, you guys stop trying to make things difficult. If you want to go on a trip together, go on a trip together. So I was like, yes. And then what the next thing I did is we had to figure out which trip we're going to go on. Do we go to India or do we go to Poland? I desperately wanted to go to India because God does all kinds of crazy, miraculous things in India. I've heard of all kinds of miracles. So I was like, let's go to India. The love of my life wanted to go to Poland. And so we were trying to figure out what we're going to do. How are we going to, what's the point? What's the plan? How do we figure out God's will for this area of our life. And so we prayed together and then we went and we prayed separately and we came back and, and I, I was like, I have this really strange feeling. I think I'm supposed to go to La Jolla Shores. <laughs> so she's like, okay, let's go to La Jolla Shores. So I went to La Jolla Shores and we were walking around and she's looking at me like, what's going on? And I was like, I have this strange feeling I'm supposed to go into the public bathroom for some reason. Not because I needed to use it, but just like this like sense, right? And so I'm going to the bathroom and I'm envisioning maybe there's like somebody there that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to meet that's going to tell me what to do. You know, some homeless guy doing a, a, a bath in the sink and he's like, thus say is the Lord, Scott. Right? And so I walk in expecting something and guess what happened? absolutely nothing. Nobody was there. There was no voice. There was nada. And I looked around like, what am I? And I walked out and Dina's like, what? what is there? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea what the purpose of that was. <laughs> right? There was nothing. I'm trying to figure out God's will for my life and he gives me nothing. And if you're anything like me, I know that you can relate. Trying to figure out God's will for your life is one of the most confusing things and frustrating things in our walk. Right? Sometimes we really need direction from God in a specific area, and sometimes he just doesn't give us anything. And we're left to guess, wonder, try to figure it out. Try to figure out who should I marry? What school should I go to? What job should I take? Should I move out of state? Should, what should I do with my life, Lord? And crickets. Question is, is it even possible to discern God's will for the decisions that face you? Is it possible? Right, the normal advice is what? pray. You need to pray. You need to read your Bible, and you need to seek God the counsel. That's how you discern God's will for your life. But what do you do when you pray and you get nothing? What do you do when you read your Bible and God is still silent? What do you do when you get God the counsel and they all disagree? <laughs> you're like, oh, what am I supposed to do? Right? And if you're honest with yourself, even though you really try to hear God's voice and figure out His will, 
we still sometimes get it wrong. Right? I've been certain of things every once in a while. I'm like, oh, I know God is leading me here, and it's disaster. And I look back, and I'm like, I totally got that one wrong. And I know you've done it, too, because you're human. So what's the answer? Today is going to be a day of freedom for some of you. That today I'm going to demystify how to discern God's will in your decisions. My goal today is some of you to disabuse you of bad thinking. Disabuse means to free from error. Bad thinking regarding how to figure out what God is leading you to. Does that sound like a plan? Perfecto. Turn to Acts 15, starting in verse 34. All right. <clears throat> Acts 15, 34. So it says, However, it seemed good to Silas to remain there. Paul and Barnabas also remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others. Then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Now Barnabas was determined to take with them John, called Mark, but Paul insisted that they should not take, them, uh, take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. Then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another and realized they never worked together again. You never see... Barnabas and, and Paul ever worked together again. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren into God's grace. And he went through Syria and uh, Sicilia, strengthening the churches. Then they came to Debris, or Derby, sorry, and Lystra. And behold, a certain disciple there was there, and his name was Timothy the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. He was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted to have him go on with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that region, for they all knew that his father was Greek. Just a side note, the reason why Paul is circumcising Timothy is because his mother is Jewish, and according to Jewish tradition... If your mother is Jewish, Jewish, you are Jewish. So he is making Timothy a proper Jew. So it's not a Gentile thing. It's a Jewish thing. He said, you're Jewish. Jews get circumcised. You're a Gentile. Stay uncircumcised. And just for a little side note, that one was free. Um, and as they went through the cities, they delivered to them decrees to keep, which were determined by the apostles and the elders of Jerusalem, those are the decrees that they're talking about when everybody came up. Should Gentiles be circumcised or not, right? And the people decided, no, they shouldn't be circumcised. There's just a couple of things that they need to keep. So they go out and they deliver that message. This is what everybody, all, all the people, the leaders in Jerusalem say. You don't have to get circumcised if you're a Gentile. So the churches were strengthened in faith and increased in their number daily. Verse 6, now when they had gone through... Phygria, in the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to Mysia, they tried to go into uh, Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mysia, they came to, down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now after he had seen the vision, immediately... We sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. All right, so the basic overview. Paul and Barnabas decide to visit the churches that they planted in their first missionary tour, uh, journey. Right? And then they get into a fight about who to take. And it actually breaks their friendship forever. Paul took Silas and heads off, and then Paul found Timothy and began discipling him for the rest of his life. <clears throat> Paul was stopped by the Spirit twice from going into Asia and preaching. 
And then Paul has a vision that took him to Macedonia. Now, I don't know if you caught it, but there's something really strange in verse 6 and 7. I read it, and I was like, that's just weird. It's just bizarre. Can you see it? The weird part? The weird part's not written on me, by the way. The Holy Spirit, Paul, needed to be stopped by the Spirit. Okay, so Paul's on his missionary journey, and the Spirit has to prevent him from doing something. Like, to me, that's strange. Right? As I see it, there's really three options. Number one, when they went out on their missionary journey, God told him to go into Asia, and then he's like, oh, wait, no, 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 I forgot. I'm sorry. I didn't mean Asia. I meant Macedonia. Then number one, God had changed his mind, and we all know that that doesn't happen, so that can't be it. Number two, Paul heard from God but misunderstood God's direction. Right? Paul heard from God, but he, he just headed off in the wrong direction because he didn't hear it accurately. Or the third option is Paul didn't pray, read his Bible, or seek God to counsel when he went out. He just lets just do it. Which one do you think it could be? Well, let's, let's see if we can gain insight by comparing those first two trips. You ready? First trip is in Acts 13, verse 1. And it says, Now in the church that was in Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers. And they had, uh, and Saul. Verse 2, As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them out. That was the first trip. Second trip, which we've already read, 1535. Then after some days, Paul, and Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit the churches that we planted and preach the word of the Lord again and see how that they are doing. What's the difference between those two, the first and the second trip? You guys catch it? Put the slide up. So the first trip is initiated by who? The Holy Spirit. Second trip is initiated by who? Paul. Right? Acts, just to let you know, some of you are like, well, it could have been the Holy Spirit. Acts is pretty clear anytime the Lord is directing something. Right? It doesn't tell you. It's like, no, the Spirit said to blah, 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 blah. Right? So, is initiated, first trip, initiated by the Holy Spirit. Second trip is initiated by Paul. First trip, the Holy Spirit handpicks who should go. The second trip, Paul and Barnabas argue and fight over who should go, and it actually broke their relationship. The first trip began in unity, the whole church coming together, laying their hands on and sending them out. Second trip began with division, destroying a, a, a solid relationship. Listen to that. Second trip, initiated by Paul. Paul and Barnabas decided who should go, and it began in division. Sounds like Paul seriously missed the will of God on this one, right? But what were the results of the trip? Paul starts a lifelong ministry with Silas. Paul starts a lifelong discipleship with Timothy. Paul plants the Thessalonian church. Paul preaches at Athens. One of the new believers that's converted actually later becomes one of the bishops of the early church, one of the leaders of the early church. Paul planted the church of Corinth. Paul met Priscilla and Aquila. Paul wrote the book, First and Second Thessalonians. Well, now I'm confused. Because that actually sounded like it was in God's will. How, how can something that sounds so like, this is just Paul's decision, and they're doing stuff in the flesh, actually be God's will? How, what are we supposed to make of that? And it all goes back to 
how God's will works. If you don't understand God's will, you will misinterpret what's going on in life and the decisions you have to make. So the first thing I want to talk about is the myth of God's perfect will. Have you ever heard that? I just want to do God's, God's perfect will for my life. What's God's perfect will? I've said it before. Don't feel bad. God's perfect will, the premise of God, like this idea that God has a perfect will for you, is the premise is that for each of our decisions that you make, God has an ideal plan that he will make known to a believer that is attentive and seeking the answer. So this idea that God has this ideal plan for your life, that if you look for it hard enough, he will give you the clues and the answer, right? And there's three traditional views right here. First is God's sovereign will, right? So this is understanding God's sovereign will. This is God's secret plan that determines everything that's going to happen in the universe. When you're going to be born, when you're going to die, all of that stuff you have no control over, and we typically don't know this one until after it happens, right? You don't know what God's sovereign will is until it has happened, and you're like, yes, that was God's sovereign will because it did happen. So God's sovereign will doesn't actually, because it's secret, doesn't affect our decision-making process. Next one is God's moral will. This is everything that's in the Bible. These are the commands that the Bible teaches us how we should live. And what God has spoken in the Bible, we are required to obey. But the problem is we're trying to make decisions is that the Bible doesn't address most of what we want decisions on. Right? We're like, what? where's my... Where's my spouse? What's the name of my spouse? And then that's where we have this idea of God's individual will. So God has an in ideal, detailed life plan uniquely designed for each person. And God's guidance for decision-making is given through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit who progressively reveals to us God's life plan to us through a variety of methods and means. This is the aspect of God's will that is usually the greatest concern for our decision making, right? This is where we stress out and get all crazy about. It's the idea of being at the center of God's will. Have you ever heard that, that phrase before? Being at the center of God's will. Can you put the next one on? Right, so God has a moral will and that super tiny dot that's your individual will that God has just for you. And it's this bullseye that you're trying to hit as you're making decisions. But choosing apart from God's perfect will, right, missing the dot will, will result in your, your life being second best. That if you miss that perfect will... You're only getting God's second best for you, not his ideal best. And so how do we try to figure out that dot? How do we hit that dot? Normally, and this is all the myth, it's, um, it's what I call the liver shivers. We interpret the inner impressions and outward signs that, that are supposed to guide us, right? The liver shivers. The, these vague feelings that we get that God is talking to you. Go down to La Jolla Shores. Okay. <laughs> Go into the bathroom. All right. What's, I don't know what's happening. But the question is, and we've all had them, like God's, I think God's urging me to do something. And I'm not saying that God does not urge. He does. It's clear that he urges. But these, where do these impressions come from that we're, we're making huge ideas about, huge decisions about who you should marry. Have you ever wondered where your impressions come from? Do they come from God? They could. Could come from an angel, could come from Satan, could come from a demon, could come from your own human emotions of anxiety or excitement. It could be a hormonal imbalance. 
could be insomnia or medication or an upset stomach. We get lots of internal impressions all the time just because you're having an impression. How do you know it's from God? That's the hard part about this. How do you know which impression is from God and which is just you having a bad day? And the two problems with, with trying to figure out impressions is number one, the Bible gives zero guidance on how to, how to interpret impressions. There's nowhere in the Bible that tells you when you feel this, that's God saying da 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 da. It, the Bible's completely silent. So you have no exterior guide, just your own subjectivity, which is the second pro- problem. It's totally subjective. If the source of our knowledge is subjective, then that knowledge is uncertain. Let me say that again. If the source of our knowledge is subjective, then that knowledge is going to be uncertain. So we we do it through inner, inner feelings. And the second thing that we're usually taught is outer signs. Look for signs right? Reading the tea leaves. It's like reading tea leaves, right? Reading signs, trying to figure out what God's saying through circumstances and situations. Sometimes you're like, what, is that? what does it mean? I don't know, right? Sometimes we, we have this idea of like, okay, we're going to put out a fleece. This is God's sign to me. I'm going to throw out a fleece to you, Lord. Anybody ever done that? Everybody's too embarrassed to admit it. It's okay. First of all, when you throw out a fleece, yes, there is one biblical example. So, just side note, anytime you're basing your relationship with God on one example and no other supporting scripture, you're on shaky ground. Just FYI. But here it is. Number one, is God obligated to answer your fleece? Is there anywhere in scripture that says when you throw out a fleece, he will he'll be like, yes, you're right. I should let you know. There's nowhere in Scripture is God obligated. So when you're like, Lord, give me a sign, do this, and then I'll know for sure that this is the the job I'm supposed to take. Guess what? He doesn't have to answer you. That's what I do to my kids sometimes. They're like, Dad, 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 Dad. You know what I do? (laughs) No response for you. (laughs) Second... Here's the second thing. If you're going to do a fleece, I know no matter what I say, some of you are going to do fleeces anyway. If you're going to do a fleece, make it supernatural. Right? The, the original fleece was, the, the Gideon laid out was, make the fleece wet and the ground dry. God did it. And then he said, okay, okay, that wasn't good enough. Make the ground wet and the fleece dry. And God did it. And he's like, okay. And still that wasn't enough. He, God needed to do another thing for him to convince him. But usually our fleeces are like, Lord, if I'm supposed to date this man, let him call in the next 30 minutes. Okay, at least just by the end of today, let him call. A text is okay too. I should probably text him first. (laughs) Right? There's nothing supernatural about that fleece. If you're going to really like, I, Lord, give me a fleece. Say, Lord, if I'm supposed to date this guy, make this podium levitate. Something that is impossible. Right? And then the second part should be, Lord, if you don't want me to marry this guy or date this guy, make this thing levitate. Don't take it, this not doing it as a no. Right? Make this levitate if it's a yes. Make this levitate if it's a no. And if you don't want to answer, don't do anything. That's how to do a proper fleece. Not this, if the mailman delivers my mail before two, <laughs> I know it's a sign. If I get a jury duty sometime this year, <laughs> you laugh because you do it. <laughs> In order for circumstances to give direction, they have to be interpreted, interpreted, interpreted. There you go. So not just fleeces, but like you're running into stuff. You're seeing China. You, you met like, sometimes we meet, like we meet somebody from China. God must be calling me to be a missionary in China. 
right? I bumped into this person. It must be a sign from the Lord. Starbucks was out of their pumpkin latte. God's telling me something. (laughs) But in order for circumstances to give us direction, they have to be interpreted. And again, Scripture gives no capacity, no direction on how to interpret circumstances. They're super subjective. Like, when does a circumstance mean a yes? When does a circumstance mean a no? When does a circumstance an open door, or when is it just the door is slightly ajar? Right? And who opened that door? Was it God? Was it Satan? Was it neither of them? Right? On the other hand, when we incur, in, in, encounter an obstacle, this is one of the problems about looking for signs, is when we encounter an obstacle in pursuit of a goal, is that, is that just a, a roadblock or is God telling me no? A lot of times we hit an obstacle and we're like, this is getting tough. God must not want me to do this anymore. Maybe, maybe he just wants you to pursue and push through. Circumstances are complex and rarely ever point to a one answer. It can be ter- interpreted many ways. So that's how we try to do it. What's the proof that we use when we've, we've interpreted God's will correctly? Usually it's the confirmation that we have this inner peace and that things work out well. Right? That's when we know, okay, I've discerned God's will correctly because I've got this inner peace. The question is, where in the Bible does it say peace comes from making a good decision? It doesn't. Nowhere in the Bible says you should have peace because you make a good decision. Think about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He says, I am, my soul is in such anguish, I feel like I'm going to die. And then he is so stressed out that he's sweating drops of blood. Did Jesus have peace in the garden? Does that mean he wasn't in God's will? This idea of peace is a poor indicator that you're choosing wisely. Right? If God is, if, if God is really calling you to something that scares you and you choose not to do it, guess what you're going to experience? peace. I don't want to do that scary thing, right? Not to say that, that when you do surrender your will to God, sometimes you do experience peace, but peace is not decision. And the real problem with the, how we approach this perfect will that God has for you is that once you, if you miss it once, you're off target for the rest of your life. Right. Can you show me the next slide? So this is God's perfect will for your life. He has this ideal plan. But the problem is you veered off course when you went to the wrong school. You went to the wrong college. Oh, my gosh, that's so horrible. Next one. And then the person you were supposed to marry wasn't there because they were at the other college. And now you're married to somebody you weren't supposed to marry. And then what happens next? You, you got the wrong job. You're living in the wrong city. Come on. How bad does it go? And the next one, right? And there's just in this, like you have kids, but you weren't supposed to have kids with this person. You're supposed to have kids with these person. You have the wrong kids. Now you're like, that's why. I understand. <laughs> that is why. If I only follow God's perfect will, my kids would behave. No, that's not the reason. The reason they don't behave is because they're kids. Every choice in this paradigm, every choice you make that deviates from God's perfect will gets you one step further away from that will. You know what this whole idea is like? It's like going to a doctor and you're sick and the doctor says, I got good news for you. I have a cure. I've hidden this cure somewhere in this building. You need to go try and find it. I'm not going to tell you where it is. I might give you a hint every once in a while, but I'm not actually going to help you find it. That's what you need to figure out yourself. This whole idea that God has one individual will that you need to find out is just like that. I've got this perfect life for you, and you need to go figure out what it is. I'll give you hints every once in a while, but I'm not going to actually tell you. The proof 
there's proof in Acts. This does not work. This is not biblical. BT dub. For you older folks, that means, by the way. In Acts, in all the book of Acts, guess how many times God gives supernatural direction to people? It's a book spanning 30 years. Guess how many times? No takers. 15. 15 times. 15 times God gives supernatural direction to people. Most of them were given to Paul, but if you look at Paul's life, most of his decisions were not determined by God's promptings. Supernatural guidance is the, expect, is the exception to the rule in Acts and also the rest of the Bible. Right, you look at the, I'm not going to do that right now. <clears throat> so let's talk about how do you actually do it. Now that we know what's wrong, let's talk about what we actually do. You ready? All right, the next slide. We've talked about this a little bit. This is God's sovereign will, right? This is everything, anything and everything that happens, happens because God chooses it to happen, right? You cannot do something that God does not want to happen. He will prevent you from doing things that go against his sovereign will. Usually, you don't know what God's sovereign will is until after it happens. Next one is God's permissive will. God has a permissive will. What does that mean? That means that God permits you to do things that he doesn't like, right? Which is sin. Basically, that word means sin. So God allows us to sin. He permits us to sin. And realize God doesn't allow all sin to happen everywhere. If sin violates his, his, his sovereign will, he stops it. You can see that with Moses and Abimelech. It's the second time Moses gives away his wife saying, oh no, she's just my sister, right? To the, the, this king in, in Canaan. Uh, yeah, no, yes, you're right. Abraham, not Moses. Abraham. <clears throat> Abraham lies and says Sarah is his sister for the second time. And this guy named Abimelech, God gives him a dream and says, I'm going to kill you and all your family. And Abimelech says, whoa, 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 whoa. This guy, this guy chumped me. I, I'm, not, I'm not to blame for this one, God. He lied to me. And God's response was, I know. That's why I kept you from sinning. God does prevent us from sinning, but not all the time. Only the ones that interrupt his will and his plan. And then you have God's moral will. This is what the Bible lays out. God permits you to sin, but your choices, this is what God wants you to do with your life, right? And just like with sin, he prevents you. Sometimes it's God's moral will. He comes along and he helps you. I've had that happen a couple times. I was about to sin and then God interrupted, right? So, how are we supposed to make decisions in this framework? The nature of effective lawmaking, right? This goes for the God, it goes for us as a society, requires where there is no command, there is an assumption of freedom. Let me say that again. Effective lawmaking, where there is no command, there's an assumed area of freedom. God created us with this extraordinary thing. It's the most powerful thing that he has given to us, and that is our free will, our ability to choose. And when we choose, it honors him because that is part of his image in us. I mean, think about it. What kind of parent would want their, their mature kids? How many of you guys got kids that are grown up? couple of you. How many of you would like your mature kids to call you for every decision that they're making? Like, mom, could you please? <laughs> Let me just move this over here. <laughs> right? It would. It would. <laughs> like, the goal of parenting is to raise your kids to the point where they can make their own decisions, good decisions. That is the, the, the goal. That is what God wants from us, to be able to use our freedom of choice in a way that honors him. And then you can go to the next slide. 
And this is where it comes to, where God gives no command in Scripture. You have the freedom and responsibility to choose. What does that mean? What job should you get? Where God gives no command, you have the freedom and responsibility to choose. Who should I marry? Where there is no command, God gives the freedom and responsibility for you to choose. If a particular decision is not directly addressed by God's commands and our goals and our attitudes are right, then it's not sin. So how does all that line up with Paul's second missionary journey? Well, let's ask some questions. Is Paul being, is Paul being a missionary part of God's sovereign will? This is what it yes looks like right here. Yes, it does. That is part of God's sovereign will. That's his call. So is, is Paul going out on a mission trip in alignment with God's sovereign will? Absolutely. Is the second missionary trip against God's moral will? No, absolutely not. That's like right in line. God wants people to be saved. It is 100% in line with God's moral will. Right? God permitted the broken relationship between Paul and Barnabas, but the trip was in alignment with God's will. So does, God, does Paul have the freedom to choose if he wants to go? Does Paul have the, is that acceptable choice to be like, hey, Barnabas, you know what? Let's go on another trip. Is that an okay? Is that within God's will for him? 100%. 100%. God called Paul to be an apostle. God's heart is to spread the, the, the gospel. Paul gets to choose, right? And if you look at it, Paul's original plan actually changed. His first plan was just to go visit churches. While he was out there, what did he decide to do? Yeah, now that we visited everybody and we're out here, why don't we go preach to people that never heard Jesus before? And so he went out. And then, well, before I do that, but what happens, like Paul had the same, the same option, when he's out, he's got choices. Where should we go? We're going to go to Asia, we can go here, we can go there. I, if I knew geography more, I'd tell you names of stuff. <laughs> and the same thing happens to us. What happens, what do we do when we are faced with two equal choices? What do you do? There's only two considerations when you're trying to figure out, do I date this person or that person? Do I go to this school or that school? Do I take this job or that job? There's only two things to consider if they're equal, right? If, they've, if they passed all the other tests, two things. Number one, wisdom. Wisdom. Is it a wise choice, right? God talks a lot about wisdom in the Bible. He actually dedicated three entire books to the subject. Is there any other subject that has three books entirely dedicated to it? The answer is no, just in case. Um, what does that tell you wisdom is? Super important. When you're making a decision, God wants to, you to use your wisdom to make choices that honor him. And then the second thing, so you ask, okay, I've got these two choices. Well, which one's the wisest choice, right? And if it's a wash still, they're both good, wise choices. You know what the, last, the, the second consideration is? Do I want to? Which one do I want to do? No, God doesn't want you to make that choice. You know what God wants you to do? This is, this is God's will for people. He wants to take them like a football player, and break their legs and make them play, uh, you know, the banjo. God wants you to do stuff you hate, right? I mean, that's how we think about it a lot. That's what we think about God. Oh, don't, don't search for God's will. He's going to make you do something you don't want to do, right? But the reality is he actually wants you to do stuff you want to do. Right? And, and some of the times what we want to do or should want to do is to become more like Jesus. So yes, we make the difficult choice. 
but he doesn't want to force you into stuff that is going to crush your soul. So, why did God stop Paul from going to Asia? This is the best part. This is the, this is the, the part of freedom. Are you ready? Why did God stop Paul? God is still sovereign. God is still sov- sovereign. Paul is exercising his free will by choosing to go preach in Asia. Totally in line with God's, God's will. But God has plans for Paul. God wants Paul to eventually write 1st and 2nd Thessalonians and 1st and 2nd Corinthians. God's like, yeah, hold off on Asia. I need you to go to these two churches so you can write a big chunk of the Bible first. And so he sends him there. What does that mean for us? Super simple. When you are faced with a decision, can you put the next screen on? Just a couple questions that you need to ask yourself. Number one, is this decision within God's moral will? Is this, can I justify this decision? Number two, is it wise? Right? And sometimes you're like, like marriage. I've got a friend who didn't necessarily make the wisest choice in marriage. He knew it was going to be tough getting into it. Right? When you marry somebody and you've got two different people, some people are easier to, <laughs> to live life with than others. And, but he chose something that was going to be a little challenging. And guess what? It's challenging. He's doing a good job trying to stay in it and all that stuff and be honoring to God. But choose wisely. Not every choice is wise for you. And then the the third question is, do I want to do it? Is this something I want to do? And then you know what the beautiful part is? The last part, trust that God is sovereign. And that if you are walking in the wrong way, you know what he's going to do? Redirect you. Right? With the other idea that there's this perfect will that I just have to get, it's so stressful. But when you realize that God created you to make choices, and if you make the wrong choices, he's going to redirect you, guess what that does? It frees you of the stress. It totally frees you of the stress. Trust God that he'll redirect you. I like to think, when I look back at my life, I like to think I've lived like four different lives. Right? There's like these things that my life completely changed. At one time, I wanted to be a concert guitarist, right? Classical guitarist, not classical rock, classical like Beethoven and Mozart. And I spent hours and hours and hours and dedicated several years to it. And then God allowed me to get severe tendonitis in my arm, and I couldn't play the guitar for like three or four years. Just stopped playing altogether. I, I wasn't able to pursue my dream. I was like, Lord, I'm going to be a... I was going to say famous, but there aren't really any famous classical guitarists. I am going to be a great, (laughs) a paid classical guitarist. But he just redirected me. And trust that God will do that. God will redirect you. God's ability to redirect is far greater than your ability to make a bad choice. I'll say that again because it's important. God's ability to redirect you is far far superior and more powerful than your ability to make a bad decision. It's not like you make a bad decision. God's like, oh man, I don't know what to do now. <laughs> Get Gabriel in here. We need Gabriel. We, the whole blueprint for life is now messed up. If you make a poor decision, he is big enough and powerful enough to redirect you to where he, he wants you to be. Oh skip all that stuff. One of, my, one of the best examples is from 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 12 through 14. This is the best example of it. It's Paul again. Paul says, furthermore, when I came to Troas, this is the second time he went to Troas, to preach Christ's gospel, 
a door was opened to me by the Lord. Right? So he goes to Trous. There's this door that gets opened to him by the Lord. God is in this, right? How many of you guys pray for open doors? Right? Paul is like, this is God. It's an open door. This is extraordinary. And the next thing says, but I had no rest in my spirit because I did not find Titus, my brother. Right? So he's at this place all by himself. God is in it. He knows this door has been opened by God. Great things are happening, but he's lonely. He's lonely. So guess what he does? He leaves. Wait, what? That's what my little girl does. Wait, what? Wait, what? He leaves. There's an open door. He knows God is in it, clearly. But he's lonely, so he just walks away from this open door. You're not supposed to walk away from open doors. Doesn't Paul know that? That's the thing. Open doors are not God's guidance. They're just opportunities that he gives you. Just because the door is open doesn't mean you have to take it. But that's a different story. And so he departed. He left. That sounds crazy, right? Listen to how he follows it up, though. Now, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. You realize what he's saying? There's this open door. I was lonely. I left. And you know what Paul calls that? Him being led in triumph. Because every place... Oh, wait. He walked away, and God led him in triumph. So God was leading him, opened a door when he was in trust. When he went to the next place, guess what God did? Opened another door and blessed him. See, that's the thing. What, what Paul is doing, God... God determines the boundaries and the direction for our life, right? His boundaries, it's like a, a, a valley. His boundaries are his moral, moral will. Do not cross over that. The direction in life is to travel this way. Be a believer. Preach the gospel. Try to be as much like Jesus every day. Learn to be a child of God. Spread the gospel. That's the general direction for each and every one of us. If you want to, go, want to know God's will for your life, boom, you can pay me after it. That's it. Just kidding, you don't have to pay me. Um, but then, in that range, we get to determine the scenery that we, that we see as we walk along the valley. That if, if you want to walk in a certain direction and you, and you love the forest, then you get to walk in the forest. If somebody likes to walk in the meadow, they get to walk in the meadow. If you're walking in the meadow and then you're like, you know what, the forest looks good, you can go back over there. As long as you are traveling in the direction God wants for you, you get to choose the scenery on the journey. You realize that? It's extraordinary. Absolutely Extraordinary. And, get, and, and this is exactly the conclusion I came to when I was like, Lord, going into restrooms hoping homeless people talk to me, <laughs> right? I realized that whichever I choose, God was going to bless. If I choose India, God's going to bless it because you know what? His heart is to preach the gospel. If I go to Poland, guess what God was going to do? Bless it. No matter what I chose, both options were good, and God was just like, hey, which one do you want to do? And when I explained that to, to Dina, I told her, it's India, babe. We're going to India. That's my desire. She's like, well, I hope you enjoy yourself. I'm going to Poland. So I went to Poland. <laughs> and you know what? It was an extraordinary trip. On that trip, I got to preach the gospel on a radio to two million people. And they enjoyed the show so much that they ran it a second time. It's extraordinary that I just had that opportunity, random opportunities. 
See, if you're living the right life, traveling in the right direction, God will bless your choices. And it's your, you get to choose. And if you choose wrong, guess what? He's just going to redirect you. One last thought before we go. There's this idea that wanting God to tell you what to choose is super spiritual and super mature. The opposite is actually true. Asking God to make your decisions for you is not spiritual, it's carnal. And it is not maturity, it's immaturity. There is a time when you need to be led by the hand and told what to do. Right? When you are a child. When, you're, when you've got little kids, you need to lead them by the hand and tell them what to do or else they get in trouble. But once you get mature, you need to start walking on your own and trusting that you know your father's will good enough that you are capable of making good decisions. It takes more faith to make decisions and trust God than it does to seek a sign from God. That's actually a lack of faith. Seeking a sign from God on what to do with your life is a lack of faith. Trusting Him that He has given you everything you need and that He will redirect you, that is true faith. And knowing that if you get it wrong, He's got your back. That's real faith. So I'm going to leave you with the questions. Here's the, uh, the end. You can come up, Scott. If you're facing a question, a decision, this is what you ask yourself. Is it in God's moral will? Is it wise? Do I want to do it? And then you just trust God that he is sovereign to watch over you. Amen? Amen. All right. Let's worship. Let's stand and worship.